Chapter 1, Review and Principles of Writing, Historical Review In ancient days, the art of writing was developed to a high degree, as may be seen from the book of the Greek statesman and general, Xenophon, written in 400 BC. Even before him, Simon of Athens had written a thorough and detailed book about the art of writing, which Xenophon mentions repeatedly. Unfortunately, this book by Simon has been lost as has the one by Plinius, which was also mentioned by Xenophon. Any horse expert who has studied this book of Xenophon's, written 2,400 years ago, cannot fail to be impressed by the preciseness of his explanations and by the insight into the feelings of the horse. His training was based on intuition and kind treatment, a policy that, unfortunately, was not always followed by riding masters in the later years. This attitude of kindness is best expressed by his own words. Anything forced and misunderstood can never be beautiful. And to quote the words of Simon, If a dancer was forced to dance by whips and spikes, he would be no more beautiful than a horse trained under similar conditions. With the fall of the Greek Empire and later with the Great Migration, the cultural value of many arts was lost. That of writing declined more and more and finally ceased to exist. To Xenophon's book must be given the credit for preserving the ideas of equestrian art to the present day, because it was his book that formed the basis of its renaissance. Nearly 2,000 years later in the 16th century, the long-forgotten art of writing, together with the other artistic accomplishments, came to light again. As the great masters of painting and sculpture began to flourish under the Italian sun, so the newly awakened art of writing was reintroduced by the Neapolitan nobleman Grisson, who was known to his contemporaries as the father of the art of equitation. Grisson had thoroughly studied Xenophon's book. He quotes, almost word for word, the instruction about the rider's seat and aids. His idea, however, was to control the horse by force, as is proved by the numerous severe bits he invented. The best known of Grisson's many pupils was Pignatelli. He was the director of the famous riding academy at Naples, to which Paluvinel came as a student from France. Paluvinel, who later became the riding master to Louis XIII, followed the instructions of Pignatelli, but added to them from his own experience. Unlike his teacher and predecessor, he advocated the individual treatment for the horse and substituted humane principles for the force and current use. His ideas were circulated in his book, Ménage du Roy, which appeared in 1623. This book was ridiculed to begin with, but in the course of time, Pluvinel's principles were accepted and prepared the path for François Rubicon de la Gagnière who later became the greatest riding master of France. As a result of this development of humaneness, the doctrines of the Duke of Newcastle, published in his elaborate book in 1657, failed to create a durable basis for the art of riding in England, partly because of the cruelty of his methods. For the same reason, George Engelhardt von Leuhausen's book, published in 1588, also failed to get a following. The influence built up by Grisson, Pignatelli, and their pupils was soon lost. In the beginning of the 18th century, the art of writing was almost exclusively influenced by France. And it was the great writing master, De La Gagnière, who produced the most revolutionary book on writing of all times. Unlike the writings of his predecessors, his book is clear and easy to understand. He based it on simplicity and facts in order to be completely understood by his readers. There is no need to discuss Gagnier's teaching in detail in this work, not because they aren't sufficiently interesting, but because they are applied, unaltered, at the Spanish Riding School and may be seen there in daily use. With the French Revolution, the doctrines of Gagnier were lost to France. Moreover, the Neapolitanic Wars brought an end to the riding academies of various courts of Europe. Only the Spanish riding school in Vienna faithfully preserved up to the present day the methods of Guignier. This was due chiefly to the influence of Max Ritter von Weihother, an outstanding horseman who was head rider at the school during the early part of the 19th century. 
His influence, which spread far beyond the confines of his country, was particularly felt in Germany, where Siedler, and even more so, Seeger and Euhausen, were his disciples. They were powerful enough to withstand the teachings of Boucher and to establish their methods so firmly that later Plinsner and Phyllis could not influence their writing in this country. Steinbrecht's book, published in 1885, was also based on their teaching. Plinsner, who worked in the royal stables in Berlin from 1874 onwards, overbent his horses, as Boucher did, and destroyed any forward urge. His followers made excuses for his methods because he trained horses for Emperor William II of Germany, who had a withered arm and had to ride with one hand. James Phyllis was introduced to Boucher's methods in France. He then spent 12 years as a riding master at the Military Academy in Petrograd and made his first appearance in Germany in a circus in 1892. He captivated his spectators at the circus and found many followers among riders who would have liked to see his methods employed in the training of military chargers. Without a doubt, Phyllis was a great artist, but interested more in the field of circus riding than in the art of classical equitation, in which all movements are based on the laws of nature. The proof of this is shown by many unnatural movements which he practiced such as the canter on three legs, the canter backwards, and the Spanish walk. In 1913, Phyllis died in Paris, as forgotten as his teacher Boucher, while the methods of the Spanish riding school still flourish. Up to the beginning of the First World War, the German cavalry school at Hanover was under the influence of the Spanish riding school through its former head rider Gebhardt. This historical development of riding reveals that the art is not confined to any special country. It flourishes wherever human beings dedicate themselves to horsemanship and know how to cultivate and develop its practice, wherever there are experts and wherever such skill brings pleasure to those who love beauty. The art of riding is indeed international. It belongs to the civilized world and is the duty of every nation to preserve and foster it in the interest of culture.